talking about the diaspora vote. That is our guiding thought today on Political Update, NTS Eclectic Ensemble with special focus on the Nigerian political scene. I am Fisai Ogunfi. Welcome. Our guest today is uh, Usani Uguru Usani, uh, a former Minister of Niger Delta Affairs, a politician, a grassroots politician, and youth mobilizer, as well as a mentor to many youths across the country. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. Uh, let me ask you, are you, have you been in retirement or have you been doing some uh, political, uh, have you been governizing some political movements from your base? For me, it's a continuous thing. There has never been a break. There has never been retirement. Whether or not the political arena is active, my lifestyle in itself is making politicians who work with me turning into a cloud of friendship. So there's no conscious effort to say because of this political event, then we are mobilizing. It's a continuous program. All right, let's uh, pick your brains a bit about some of the conundrums that we've faced in the past year. Um, uh, the drum beats, the, uh, the verbal jousting, the summer swords from the podium have <coughs> always been around elections. Uh, gubernatorial, chairmanship, and all that. How can we begin to galvanize our political movement in such a way that ideologies and cross fertilization of ideas become uh, the main driving force of the political space, not that national or state cake that is being baked and cooked and uh, cut at uh, intervals? Fine. I'll begin to answer this with the background of 2015 elections. In the 2015 elections that took place, you found that there wasn't a need or reason. less rancor and chaos free. But when men impose their opinions as if they are rewriting what should guide a process, whereas they are established norms, then it becomes chaotic. And ultimately, it means that system loses focus. And the people will also lose confidence in that system. Therefore, the answer to your question will be, let us abide by acceptable set rules without imposing our opinions as if they are the standards of society in any event. In your experience, apart from being a politician, you were also a lecturer at different times. Uh, in terms of ideologies, in terms of positions, how can we sustain our democracy in such a way that uh, those low-hanging fruits, those dividends that we continue to allude to, become uh, almost something that uh, we can almost take for granted and not just uh, something that is being handed down as if uh, they are gifts? Indeed. We are all involved in politics, but most of the time, because of the way we have defined politics, it becomes a, a thing of shyness to be addressed as a politician. Not because politics is bad, but because of our redefinition of politics, especially in Nigeria. Now, I tell you, not many of us in the Nigerian political space believe in ideology. But I fervently believe in it. And that is why I have never worked on the other side of the political scene. I've been consistent where I am. With the belief and hope that those who identify with this realm of my own uh, 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 faith in politics or faith in politics will conduct themselves in the manner that befits what the ideology we believe would be. Unfortunately, we have been seen in society to look like every politician just wants to milk out of the possible and available which is an unfortunate thing. Therefore, the only thing that will get us to abide in <coughs> character and function to the norms of political ideologies will be self-reorientation to define values and follow them by the conduct and moral content of our behaviors. Without that, we are wasting our time. And that is the reason one man can try the best he can. But because the surrounding is all messy, not believing in ideology, but believing in the interest of the pocket. And they tell you, politics, is no permanent friend, no permanent enemy, but permanent interest. interest. Good enough. Good philosophy. Mm. But what is the interest? Define the interest. Is the interest building national sovereignty? Is the interest building a crime-free society? Or is the interest filling your pocket and then freeing yourself 
from the blunders of society by living abroad and starting the wealth abroad. So we must define the interest. So when they make such a vague philosophical statement, we should compel ourselves to define what that interest is before we endorse and enlist in it. Let, let, let me now uh, tell you a bit about my interest. My interest is somewhere you administered in the past, that's in Niger Delta. Correct. Uh, going forward, looking at that region, its huge resources, apart from, you know, from beneath the soil, the one that we can readily see, I'm talking about his team in youths, so how do we begin to galvanize? There has been a, uh, an audit that has been commissioned and all that of the Niger Delta Development Commission, but looking at the entire Niger Delta, how do we see this region going forward, not just as a cash cow, but as something sustainable, especially for his team in youths? From the hindsight of uh, experience and knowledge and practice in the governance of that region, I think you will need more than two hours to talk about this situation. But in brief, I will tell you, the first enemy of man is himself. The first enemy of man is himself, and it is an epitome demonstrated in the administration of that region. I weep every day, because the very things you see in trying to move the region forward is people who will let you know that then they're hungry. I they hungry. So if you're hungry, you go chop the whole money where you take Bill Road. That is the type of thing you find there. No matter how hard you try to do, in fact, they go with the blackmail to make sure that in trying to do what is proper for their growth and development, you become an outlier in the system that should form the normal society to enrich knowledge and capacity for human beings. So what is the conversation we should be having going forward? The conversation then should be self-orientation. I've said it. In the entire Nigeria, even if it is worse in some enclaves and others, Nigerians must learn to believe in something else. One, self-discipline. And two, restraint in promoting our interests. Because here we find ourselves promoting interests above the national interests. And I pity people who were not born 50, uh, before 50 years ago. Why I say so is because if anybody had had an inkling of the implications of war, or anybody wants to experience what it is by going to the Northeast to live and see the trauma, you will not do anything that will threaten the unity and peace of the country. Unfortunately, this is where we are. Mr. Usani and Guru Sani, you've been giving us uh a political lecture and succinctly put also, of course I was not born 50 years ago, but I will lean on your experience. <laughs> that has been this aspect of it. Of course, we we'll take uh, a, a little, a small report on uh, some political developments. When we return, we'll be having a conversation on the diaspora votes and what it means, especially to uh, citizens uh, beyond our shores and how they can contribute to national development. Stakeholders of the governing APC from South South say the call for National Executive Committee meeting to hold on Tuesday, 17th March 2020 is timely. Spokesperson of the forum, Ray Murphy, while addressing journalists in Abuja says, now is the time to come together and rebuild the APC. Because that is the only way we can bring an opportunity for the party to regain itself. Unless you have that meeting, you cannot have any basis with which to rebuild this party. We support it and we ask our people from all over the country, we ask APC people from South South, from Nigeria, to lend their support to that next meeting, to give the leaders of this party an opportunity. And this is why we came today as South South people, bona fide South South citizens, to urge Nigerians to realize that the APC is a party in power and everybody should do everything to support the president to bring good governance to the people. Nigeria is a nation guided by law and order. So is the nation's electoral process. Coalition for Transparency and Democratic Leadership believes that Nigeria Procurement Act also suggests processes through which government contracts can be awarded and spelt out categories of companies that are not eligible for such contracts. It is therefore worrisome that some politicians would allegedly violate these laws through its activities during the election. We therefore passionately plead that this case is given same attention like you did 
to Senator Joshua Diary and former Governor Jolene Yame. We must also use this medium to commend EFCC under your performing leadership for your giant strides and unmatched results. This is making corruption to become uninteresting to Nigerians. We assure you of our readiness at all times to support you and your office with useful information and solidarity. The coalition enjoins the FCC to look into the allegations and bring the offenders to justice as it is doing in the investigation and prosecution of arms funds for campaign in the same November 16th governorship election in Bielsa State. Meanwhile, with the Supreme Court verdict on Imo State governorship election, Tozu brought to a halt, citizens are calling on the political class to close ranks in the interest of the state. It's time for us to reach out to one another and rededicate ourselves, search our conscience, rededicate ourselves you know, to democratic ideas of peace, tolerance, love, rule of law. We need to all come together to work towards the development of greater Imo State. In time of worldly things, we overlook things and forgive and forget is very necessary for peace to reign in the country. Power belongs to God. It's only Almighty God can give you power. Say you are the one to be the governor of Imo State or you are the one to be the president of Nigeria or governor of Sokoto or governor of Zamfara. It's only Almighty God can give you that power. This is APC, this is PDP. We are all one. We are all one Nigeria. Okay. I have been directed by His Excellency the Executive Governor of Kano State, Dr. Abdullahi Umar Ganduje OFR, based on the powers conferred on him by the provision of Section 11, Subsection 1 of the Kano State Emirate Council Law 2019, that is equivalent to Hijra 1441 to announce the appointment of Al-Haji Amina Ado Baero, the former Emir of Bichi Emirate, as the new Emir of Kano. 60-year-old Amina Ado Baero is the second son of late 13th Fulani ruler of Kano Alaja Ado Baero. The 1984 graduate of mass communications from Bayer University, Kano, Aminu also holds a master's degree in business administration. Subsequently, he trained and worked as a commercial pilot till the early 1990s when he was turbaned Damaji by his late father, Alaja Ado Bayeru. From that period to May last year when he was appointed Emir of Bichi, Aminu held various other titles including Damburam, Traiki, Sarkindawakin Sakargida and Wambai. He succeeded Muhammad Sanusi II, who was deposed following allegations of disloyalty and violation of some provisions of new Kano Emirate law amended by the state government. Sanusi has been on the throne since June 2014. He succeeded the 13th Fulani Emir, Alaja Adobayaru. Muhammad Sanusi II served as the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria between 2009 and 2014. In Kano, Abdullahi Mustafa, NTA News. The Executive Director of the Niger State Primary Health Care Development Agency, Dr. Ibrahim Dangana, is among many that believe that Nigeria as a nation has faced severe tests and trials in her drive towards nationhood. He joins other like minds here in Abuja to examine some of the core challenges bedeviling the country with a view to coming up with a resolve to establishing a sense of common belonging among the diverse ethnic groups within the nation. We will say we've come a long way post-independence, but we are not where we want to be as a country. We are still battling with basic necessities of a country. Nigeria, like every other country, has their, we have our own challenges. So I don't call it a problem because I know there are things you can work on and get a result. Convener of the conference, Dr. Henry Debem, identified greed and selfishness as major factors militating against achieving a united and peaceful society for all. There's nobody that can stay alone or survive in isolation. So we have this mandate that this generation might be the last generation that will have the last chance 
to the model of this country. The underlining message here is the clarion call on Nigerians to remain their brother's keeper and stay together now like never before. In Abuja, Timothy Yusuf, NT News. All right, talking about diaspora voting, that's a very important part of the Nigerian population are uh, doing very well uh, in different parts of the world uh, beyond our shores. Uh, I have Professor Ali Alao, uh, he's in the Diaspora Voting Council, to uh, begin the conversation. Uh, Professor Alao, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Uh, let's let's start uh, this way. I hope you still you still have uh, some uh, knowledge of the local language because your accent seems uh, uh, British these days. Not really. I'm a son of the soil. That should tell you something. <laughs> <laughs> so tell tell me a bit about um, you know the conversations you've had, especially with uh, you know the authorities as to exploring the opportunities that are inherent in having a population in the diaspora participate in our voting uh, exercises. Yeah, thank you very much once again for this very beautiful question. It's an opportunity and a privilege for us to be given that good listening ears about these very core issues that have been on our plate for a very long time. Uh, we in diaspora, not just in UK, but world over, from even continent Africa, we've been yearning for this, nothing new. We're just trying to tell the government, as we heard, that well, the legislature, they made us understand that, look, it's not about them, it's about law. But at the same time, law wasn't just made by itself. It's made by the same legislator. It's about looking in how they can amend the law in order to suit, to accommodate the diasporans. When we say diasporans, I mean we are forced to be reckoned with. On the economic part of things in Nigeria, we contributed a very, not just a chunk, a big chunk of what comes in terms of Nigerian revenue yearly. So as a result, I believe we, uh, we are one of the key stakeholders when it comes to the affairs of Nigeria as a whole. Okay, let's look at how it's done in other climes, yeah, Israel, India, and all that. Um, how do you want this to be done? In it might take a while, because even locally, in terms of uh, the sheer number, uh, we've had some challenges even in you know locally here when we are talking of about timelines uh, what are you saying first getting it passed through uh, getting the legislative aspects you know through and then looking at the workability of it uh, thank you we've been promised by the legislator that we're representing yesterday we have people like someone like uh, the house speakers of assembly that means uh, honorable bajabi amila and then uh, there's some other senators and the the lady in charge of the naidu that means the the commission of the diasporans uh, lady uh, abike dabiri she was there as well and others and other stakeholders they promise it's nothing new i mean if a country like mali can get it right. Nigeria is a giant of Africa, the largest, the largest, um, what we call it, economy in the whole Africa. We, we shouldn't be lacking behind when it comes to the, we shouldn't drag our feet. It's just about, okay, well, we can't just, it's not about bomb rushing. It's long overdue. We've been pushing this for very long, but I believe uh, it is, is, is the right time to just make it happen. And the nothing should be stopping us at this moment in time. Let me feel your pause a little in terms of our uh, the diaspora, Nigerian diaspora. Uh, are you organized uh, beyond our shores? Are you organized in terms of uh, even your general agitations, in terms of, you know, coming as one voice? Is it organized? I can say we are well organized beyond what you can reckon. This is not, I mean, kind of like one party or the other, it's bipartisan. Even those who doesn't believe in the political system, they all just want to contribute their quota. If we, as I said, when you look at Nigerian economy, check, the statistics doesn't lie. This is not our record, but the World Bank, what Nigeria generates from the diasporans yearly is humongous. It's in billions of, it's in billions of Naira. So the same very people, why, why come when come to politics, the political affairs of the nation, mm. we are not taking part. Mm. We really want to participate. It doesn't really matter with affiliation, our party affiliation. It's something I believe, we personally believe, the only way we can also 
contribute our own quota to know that we're really serious about the state of affairs in Nigeria is by giving us this very opportunity that I believe is our, is our God-given right, let alone the Constitution, that we are Nigerians. And the only way we can also prove that we are Nigerians, not only our money, that we remit year, year in, year out. We should have a voice, one man, one vote. That's all we're asking for. We don't ask for too much. Okay, I haven't said that though. I must make us realize, not everywhere, because not every country of the world, Nigeria has its uh, embassy or its high commission. But at least, be it 50 or 40, or uh, it might be in common form of even a parallel scheme. Let's start from continent Europe, that everything is well organized in terms of to reach the embassy or through the electronic voting or so. Uh, I guess long overdue. Uh, according to their own statistics, they say we have 25 million registered Nigerians in diaspora. That's humongous. That's more than many countries. And, uh, but I have this question. I'm just curious. Uh, permit me to ask this question. I'm just curious. What about the Nigerians? There are Nigerians who are abroad but uh, have the green passport only. But there are Nigerians who are abroad who also vote in those countries. They still want to vote in Nigeria. Is there not a conflict of interest? At all. Mm. Not at all. We cannot disfranchise them. In as much we still believe they are born and bred. Okay. If we say that, what about those service men and women? abroad that have been staged maybe they serving under UNICEF or United Nations mission or on the World Health Organization should we disfranchise them and say okay well for the fact that you're in the foreign land you are not entitled to vote so the same thing applies in as much they are Nigerians and they are living there I mean they are paying their taxes and they are remitting something back to they have their families here they should be part of the I mean shaping the the, the, the political narrative in Nigeria Professor Ali Alao of the Diaspora Voting Council, I wish you the very best uh, in your future endeavors as well as uh, getting this over the line. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you very much. That's, one of, that's been one of our conversations, of course, the second of our conversations on the show. Let's, uh, before we close shop, let's take this and then we'll come and wrap up. Afan will thrive better if elections are held and they are transparent and the people are freely given the chance to elect their leaders. And that is the only way we can grow our democracy. That is why America is where it is today. We can see what is happening now. The Democrats are trying to, to bring out a candidate to contest against the incumbent. Look at what they are doing. It is very transparent and the people are being asked to come. That is why in Afan the election means the state chairman who are duly elected by representatives from the local government areas and the wards have emerged to now become the electorate for the national office. Since we are present in the 774 local governments, everybody, every farmer who is in Afan is given the chance to contribute their quota in the emergence of the leadership. And that is how we became leaders. That's how we were inaugurated. And this is the same way that we feel Afan executives should emerge. And, and uh, once this ethos becomes part of us, Afan is working in tandem with the Nigerian government to be able to have free and fair elections. been political updates for today which is a Friday of course uh, we'll be back on Tuesday hoping that you stay with us NTA Africa's finest and largest who gives you the very best of news, reviews, previews and interviews. My name is Fisai Ogunfi urging you to play your politics for the greater good. Bye bye now.
Personal hygiene. Wash hands with soap under running water or use an alcohol-based sanitizer if water is not available. Avoid touching your face with your hands. We must also protect others. If we are sick, we should rest and recover at home as much as possible. If we need to go out and see a doctor while sick, we should wear a surgical mask to protect others from being infected. This message is from the National Orientation Agency. Nigeria is home to a rich diversity of forests, vegetation, wildlife, and the protection conservationists believe is very important as this will help preserve biogenetic resources, this wildlife species, the timber, the fuel, wood, as well as uh, mitigate the current climate change issues. Now, is the wildlife and vegetation well protected in Nigeria? My guests should be able to provide answers because he's dealing with this on a large scale. My name is Blessing Abu. Welcome to the program on the spot. My guest was born on the third day of April in 1958 in Busa, Niger State. He had his primary and secondary education in the same locality of Niger State. He was at the College of Education Sokoto in 1979. My guest later in 1987 proceeded to the Usman Danfodia University Sokoto and part of BSc in Education in Biology and followed it up with a Master's in Technology from the Federal University of Technology Akure, that's in Ondo State. And his focus was on agriculture, technology, in, and uh, wildlife management. First appointment came in 1983 as Park Superintendent at Kaiji Lake National Park. I think that should be the first one. I want to get to find out soon. His current appointment as the Conservator General National Park Service came in 2017. On the spot this week, is Ibrahim Mosagoni. Welcome to the program, CJ. Thank you very much, Blessing, mm -hmm. and thanks for having me. Welcome. Yes, sir, uh, like I was trying to say, I think the Kanji Wildlife, uh, the Lake National Park was the first one. The very first, one. The first national park. The first national park. Yes. Okay, yes. great. Now let's even start from the very basic uh -huh. national park service, national parks. Was the, uh, was the nexus between them and other things we see around as parks? Well, thank you very much. National Park Service is the umbrella. Of course, it has a seal, and it is a service that can be sued and be sued. Okay. Under the service, you have seven unit national parks. Okay. The Kainji, the Oroyo, the Gashaka Gumti, the Chad Basin, the Cross River, the Okomu, the Kamuku, and uh, of course, the uh, I think I've mentioned them all. Okay, I think one, two, seven. three, four, five, six, seven years. Yes. So tell us the status of these parks, really, how viable are they from what people say or describe them, for, apart from you working there. <laughs> we'll the status of the national parks is something that can be described as good because when you look at the mandate, what is the mandate? The mandate is to ensure that the biodiversity contained therein is protected and given to the public for use. So the seven national parks are intact with the animals. The animals differ from one ecological zone to the other. Okay. You do not expect to find forest animals in savannah national parks, and you do not expect to find savannah animals in forest national parks. Mm. So the biodiversity therein is based on the ecological resources 
that are contained there. Then, uh, to this extent, in the savannah we have animals like buffalo, we have animals like the medium, big size, and small size antelopes, and we also have monkeys like the red, mm -hmm. you see the green, you see, and of mm -hmm. course the baboon. Okay, for the purpose of education, some of us might assume we know which is the savannah, which is the mangrove, which is the... So where, let's petition the, uh, the topography of the country. Okay. Where do we have the so, national parks like Kainji Lake National Park, Kamuku National Park, Chad Basin National Park, Oroyo National Park, and Gashaka Gumti National Park. These are Savannah National Parks. Okay. So these are where you find the buffalo I've mentioned, the medium, the small, medium, and large size antelopes, the baboons, the red monkeys, the green monkeys, and of course a variety of other reptiles, snakes, pythons, and of course the others. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the forest national parks like Okum, Okumu National Park and Cross River National Park. Cross River, of course, is the largest rainforest in Nigeria and the oldest rainforest in Africa. Oh. So oldest in old, Africa. Oldest in Africa. But it's still not. It's not the largest. It's not for the Africa. largest. It's not the largest. But largest for Nigeria. The largest for Nigeria. Okay. Then in we have these forest elephants in both places. Okay. Then you have uh, the drills, that is the gorillas, yes. the chimpanzee, and of course the drill. The drill is the forest baboon. In the savannah we call them the baboon. In the forest we call them the drills. Drill. Okay. drills. So, and this is what informs Nigeria's presence in the Convention on International Trade in the endangered wildlife flora, fauna and flora sites, particularly the gorilla in the Cross River National Park. The gorilla in Cross River National Park, they are lowland gorillas. When you compare what obtains in the, the Rwandan gorillas and highland gorillas, mm. but ours are the lowland gorillas. And this extends up to the Adamawa Mambila Plateau area, where you can find this gorilla. Okay, this. so each of these uh, parks now, like you've already told us now, contain these animals. Yes. Intact. For the delight of the tourists. Okay, but then... I've not mentioned the, f the elephant in the savannah. Okay. Because for long we have not been able to sight them. Are they where we, where we currently well? sight savannah elephant is in Yankari Game Reserve, which okay. of course is no longer under the mandate of the federal government. Oh, so where is it now? Yankari is now a game reserve. Okay. So that is, this is what differentiates a national park from, from a game, game reserve, reserve or a forest reserve. Oh, okay. A national park, whatever, are managed by legal, legally established federal government of, every can, of that country. Okay. Whereas forests and game reserves are managed by state governments. Okay. That is why the constitution says national parks are on the exclusive legislative list whereas forests and game reserves are on the concurrent, concurrent list. list. So what are the greatest concerns that run across board, whether for the games reserve and also for the national parks? Because we know, yes, I know you have your mandates structured out for you, yes. but what are your greatest concerns in managing wildlife, in managing the, diver the, the diversity to our, our fauna and, uh, uh, and all of those that our, actually... Our greatest concern range from our population the human population in Nigeria, okay. to the type of activities we carry out in the forest and uh, in the environment sector. For example, when I say population, because of population increase, which is not commensurate with land increase, land is static, you find out that where a land area that is being cultivated by one person might now be cultivated by two or three persons. And that means there's need for more land to be added to the one that is cultivated by these people. Okay. That has allowed people to encroach, to encroach into either the forest reserves, the game reserves, and of course some buffer zones around the national parks. Okay. Yes. So another may be the challenges of uh, 
may be weak structures. Such as? In some of these uh, states, the forest guards, the game guards, are not well empowered because the emphasis in those areas might not be in the forest or the game reserves. Oh. So it means the forest reserves and the game reserves are let loose. This is one of the reasons we have these security challenges of banditry, uh, uh, cattle wrestling in the forest areas so today. So I, I, I know when you came into office, you had a set targets, yes. especially for one who joined the service even at, uh, at, uh, at that particular time you joined and you have seen, uh, as you move through the ranks, you know the greatest uh, problems or constraints for the national parks. Yes. What are your guiding, uh, your guiding principles and uh, also what are those guidelines you have set out, okay, you need to do to tackle some of this area? You've talked about rangers and also aspects of other insecurity that has uh, pervaded the, the service. So when I came to the office, I looked at what is on ground and tried to set my own targets. And from the views of most Nigerians, national parks is not hard off. So this means I have to set a target to be able to create awareness about the national parks. When people are aware, it is either they accept your idea or they don't accept it. Mm. Where they accept, your job is 50% done. So this is one thing I focus on. And by the time I came on board, thank God, let me thank the federal government. It had already classified the National Park as a paramilitary agency. That means we have been given an impetus to move forward. So that impetus has actually gingered us into trying to enforce the paramilitary ethics we are enforcing today. Hmm. And that has brought us at par to our sister organization in countries outside this and other countries like Kenya, Tanzania. Kenya, Tanzania, even Cameroon here, the national parks are under, they are, they are, part, of the para, they are part of the military set setup. So thank God the government has given us this impetus. We are today part of the paramilitary so, setup. Having been given this impetus, how has that helped redirect some of the activities at the National Park Service? Yes. The impetus has actually helped because today we wear full uniform. We, been, we also enjoy the paramilitary salary structure, which of course is different from the public service sector. And the fact that uh, we wear uniform, that has boosted our ego and has also given us respect from members of the community who now looked at us as part of the paramilitary setup. And whenever there are cases of even insecurity, they try to engage us and we have been delivering it. It's either we share the information mm. or we tackle. Okay. Yes. So what's in the gap when you uh, change from just the ordinary uh, ordinary clothing to yes. that of a uniformed uh, paramilitary uniformed person? Yes. If that has changed the narrative for the National uh, Park Service, we'll find out from you after this break. All right. Thank you. You're watching on the spot, and my guest is the Conservator General of the National Park Service, Ibrahim Musagoni. We'll be right back with him after this break. Advertising your goods and services on the right channel gives you an edge over your competitors. NTA News 24 has all the platforms for your target audience. The station is on DSTV Channel 419, Go TV Channel 46, Star Times Channel 101, and Free TV Channel 703. With our digital format and wide range, we can reach your customers in next to no time. We are eager to promote your business, goods, and services. So, partner with us for a very rewarding business experience. For more information, Please call Henry on 0803-379-0884 or visit our office at NTA Headquarters, Area 11, Kanki Abuja. NTA News 24. News and more news. Tuned in, the program is on the spot and my guest is Ibrahim Musagoni. is the Conservator General of the National Park Service. Well, so we're looking at um, what's in the uniform <laughs> to actually keep National Park Service 
going well. Now, let's take a look at protecting what we even have beyond people maybe coming to poach some species of uh, wildlife and some other areas. What is the attraction for me if I must go to the National Park? What should be there? Uh, I know there are different ones cut across the country. Let's take, for instance, Abuja. Well, the attractions in the national parks are numerous. The issue of a national park in Abuja, there's no national park in Abuja. Okay. What so what, have, can, what can I see in Abuja in terms of What you can see in, in Abuja are just uh, mere zoological parks, mini parks, and of course, the wildlife park and the children park. Okay, so these are the attractions. Okay, so for residents of the these federal are capital, aspect, these are aspects of ex situ conservation. Okay, the forest, game reserve, and national park are aspects of in situ conservation. Okay, yes. What does that mean? Ex situ, you have human intervention. The animals, in most cases, are provided with supplements. When they are sick, you bring in the veterinary doctor to look at them. But in the in situ. You allow nature to take its course. Okay. Yes. So which is the closest natural habitat that could, a federal capital territory is exposed to? The closest national parks the federal capital is uh, open to is the one in Benengwari, that is Kaduna State, okay. the Kamuku National Park. Okay. And, uh, of course, the Kanji Lake National Parks. Okay. But for ease of movement, where we have... Uh, air, uh, airline facilities, or your is there, Cross River is there, okay. even Chad Basin National Park is What's the capacity for the National Park Service um, at least in terms of um, personnel to so going to be serving as guides and some other things? So actually, it, because you already talk about awareness, people need to be aware of what is going on at the National Park. So for the capacity, this is where we're having the challenge. Okay. But we are trying to complement this with ICT, that is technology, mm. using things like uh, drones, mm. smarts, and uh, of course, uh, these uh, camera traps. For the camera traps, you go into the park, set it. Mm. So it captures movement, whether of animals or of intruders. By the time you bring it, you analyze, you'll be able to trace an intruder back to his village. For the smart, it's, uh, it's a technology you use. Mm. Even within a short time, you are able to assess an your, your, your park area. Okay. And for the drone, too, we are currently discussing with the Office of the National Security Advisor to clear us so that we can begin to use drone to monitor our park's activity. This will complement the number of officers we have. Because presently, hmm. we have not met the world standard as uh, designated by the International Union for Conservation of Nature. Okay, so what, uh, yes, you've had to say that about two, three times now, meeting the standard. What exactly should be the standard for a typical national park? For a typ what should we see? What should we not see? Well, for a typical national park and the, the human capacity, the world over the national park has achieved that standard because it is said that for every 10 kilometers square in the savannah, you need one ranger. For f every five kilometer square in the forest, you need one ranger. Okay. No national park in the world is yet to attain that. Okay. So Nigeria's case is not a different case. Okay, so beyond rangers pursuing poachers and some other intruders, yeah. what other service is the national park offering the public? The national park offers you leisure and recreation. Because uh, you have just talked about capital flight a few minutes ago. Mm. People who are going out for, uh, at least, viewing animals outside this country, people going, going, going out for holidays and the rest of them. We have this facility, like I've always said, we have these resources in this country. And the diversity of animals we have is beyond the diversity of animals found in South Africa, East Africa. Uh, they only have the serious? number. They, have, they only have the number, many numbers. A species might, they may have a species maybe of, uh, maybe Ronan Tello. Ronan Tello, they will have about 50, 100. But in our own case, you may find out that where you, where, when you come, you may have a Ronan Tello in 10s, 15s, and the rest of them. So if we have the higher number, what, what, how come we've not diversity. been able to... Diversity. 
diversity. Yes. How come we've not been able to harness to the level which South Africa, Kenya, and some other East African countries have been able to do effectively? Yes, we have not been able to harness because uh, oil came in. When we started in the 60s and 70s, mm. we were doing well, managing, even that was the era of game reserves and forest reserves. Mm. Our forest reserves and game reserves were intact. Mm. But as soon as oil came, we forgot the aspect of the environment. Everybody went into oil, mm. which we looked at as easy oil, easy money. Okay. And today, the environment is suffering. Okay. Yeah. Now, let's look at laws protecting this wildlife, because if, if we must get it right and actually start representing this to the public, are there laws protecting this wildlife? And um, how stringent are these laws? I mean, how stringent have they been put in place? There are laws protecting the wildlife, even in the states, in the local governments, and at the federal level. At the federal level, you have uh, the National Park Service Act 46 mm. that at least gives us the mandate to ensure that these national parks, one, will protect a crucial ecological resources, two, to ensure that the variety of species are protected, and three, to allow visitors to come visit to see what we are actually doing. Okay. That way, at least we will be able to garner some revenue for the government. And this is the diversification of the economy mm -hmm. the government is pursuing. I know, I, I'm not sure if this falls within your purview, but I still have to talk about it because from water, we're surrounded by water, we're surrounded by land, we're surrounded by hills, we're surrounded by desert. From time to time, or at least in recent times, we've seen uh, clips on the social media and some other means uh, of wildlife, or especially sea animals, fish and the large one being uh, washed ashore. We've seen one recent bias, there was one in Lagos and some other parts, if I will recall. And the next minute, you see Nigerians coming out in their numbers with cutlass and all manner of uh, machete <laughs> to come and butcher that, that this is manna from wherever. Are those not some of those endangered uh, species of animals that we're talking about? And um, who should be responsible to guard against such? Thank you very much for this interesting question. The Baeza whale that was uh, being hurt, as shown in the social media, is an endangered animal. And uh, we have uh, an agency established by the government, that is NESRA, that is responsible for endangered species all over. Okay. Then, in addition to that, the Federal Department of Forestry okay. also has advisory rules okay. to play, advising state government, local government, on what to do with their forest resources. It is not mandated that they must accept what the forestry is telling them, no. Then, the National Park Service, one of our objectives is to advise the federal government on wildlife related matters all over the country. Mm. And this is why when the issue of that will came, I made a statement to the fact that the community around that area have rushed into hacking that animal. One, there are supposed to be a scientific study to determine what was what is the cost, what is the cost of death? It could be chemical. Then you consume chemical, you consume that animal, you consume a chemical. Then Nezra is supposed to have been, been there, maybe are invited to look at the animal so that they'll be able to report. Do these communities actually know those are kind of things they should be doing? This, That's is, another this thing. is what the Department of Forestry in that state is supposed to know. Hmm. And they have told you to constitutional provision, hmm. so I will not be able to speak okay. for the state. Okay, okay. Yes. all right, like, since it's not under your purview yes. directly. Yes. Now, climate change is another major phenomenon yeah. for uh, park service, and I'm sure because of the conservation of all what you have under your, under your purview, what, what is being done to actually work alongside uh, experts. We are one of the important agencies contributing to the mitigation of climate change in this country because uh, we have 3% of the forest cover. Nigeria forest cover presently is just about 6.7% and we, ha we contribute 3%. So meaning that half of the mitigation is being done in the national parks. And the government is also encouraging the planting of uh, other species of plants 
to increase to increase the forage cover by way of adopting the green bond program. Okay. So last How is year, that coming on? Very well, it is coming on very on. Okay. The first, we witnessed the first leg, and at least we were able to contribute. Uh, for the national park, we were able to contribute about 90, uh, 9,000 9, 9, square I mean, uh, hectares. Okay. So as we have um, endangered uh, wildlife, do we have uh, endangered uh, vegetation and plants as well? Of course. Okay. There so are, there are, are you looking into this direction? There are, there are plants that are endangered, particularly the rosewood. Okay. At the last CITES convention, rosewood were moved from category two to category one. Okay. Meaning it is now endangered. So and uh, this so where is, do we have rosewood before? Where, where is it much before? Rosewood is found. Uh, Everywhere, particularly okay. you find the, the, you have you have that of the forest, you have that of the savanna. So and uh, all over the savanna, so you find rosewood. What can it be wood. used for? Rosewood is a very precious uh, wood that uh, you don't. By the time you plow the wood, you don't need to do any design on it. It is naturally designed, and that is why it is very suitable for furnitures and other types of uh, Okay, perhaps that's use. why they're going after it, human. But yes. they should replant. That's what we're encouraging. <laughs> okay. Yes. All right. We, we must go now. Well, I know funding is always usually on the lips of many governments, establishments, agencies, and, and I'm sure you're not left out. Yes. What would you want to see differently as you move on with your mandate and uh, agenda you have set for yourself? Increasing my budget and also improving on my effort to get donor support. Okay, yes. but is the service not looking towards some other aspect they can actually do to turn around uh, the, the tide as well? This is what uh, the service is actually pushing through the partial commercialization program. The government has already penciled down three of the national parks for partial commercialization, meaning the infrastructure in these parks will be improved, hmm. given to an entrepreneur to run. Why the government is saddled solely with the protection of the resources they are in. Hmm. So that way, We'll be able to bring more attractions into the park, bring in more people, and increase the revenue base. Okay. Yes. Okay, yes. Conservative General, <laughs> National Park Service, Badger, thank you very much for coming on the spot today. Thank we appreciate th your time, and we hope um, with this, more enlightenment will go to the public thank you very on much. how to visit the nearest park. Thank you very uh, much. For, uh, well, yes. I think um, th that's a big one. We should actually uh, return the capital flight into, into, into <laughs> we our We should reverse it. We should reverse it. And yes. that uh, definitely will do well for you and your many uniform. Thank you very <laughs> much. Thank you. Blessing. That's on the spot this yes. week with the Conservator General, National Park Service, Ibrahim Mosagoni. Thank you for coming. And also, we thank you, Avia, for watching. We ask you to join us again on another edition of the program with another interesting guest. My name is Blessing Abu. Goodbye. It continues live on Star Times with top clubs fighting for glory. Manchester United, Inter Milan, Sevilla is the first leg of the round of 16. Fans of the Red Devils don't miss Manchester United match as Igalo leads the attack against ASK on March 12th at 6.15.